All right, today we're going to talk about the three branches of government. Now, this is obviously a concept that many of you have been aware of since you were in elementary school. Um, we're just going to review the basics, and then especially when we get to the judicial system, um, we're going to go into some detail that you may not already know about how that system works. All right, so we're actually going to start with the legislative branch. The legislative branch is described in Article One of the Constitution, and the most important piece of the Constitution that tells us what the legislative branch's role is, is what's called the enumeration clause. So Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution gives us the enumeration clause, and all that means is it's numbering, it's enumerating powers that are specifically granted to Congress. So if you think back to the Articles of Confederation, one of the failures is that there were certain powers that were not granted to a legislative branch, even though the legislative branch was the only real governing power um, in the Articles. So if you look at this list of enumerated powers, Congress has the power to impose and collect taxes, to borrow money, um, establish post office, maintain a navy, and of course and other branches of the military later on. <clears throat> so the enumerated powers simply states specifically what Congress is permitted to do. Um, now, Congress is split into a number of committees. Um, my screen is not showing us the list, so in class you're going to take a look at a list of congressional committees, but there are many. One of the ways that the individual voices of the congressmen and then, of course, the people they represent are heard is by having congressmen serve on committees that address more specific issues from budget and ways and means to education, to homeland security. So they're able to focus on areas where they have a little bit more expertise, and then that way they can focus on creating laws that have specific targeted purposes. Now, the executive branch is described in Article Two of the Constitution. You might remember the Articles of Confederation did not have an executive branch, but this is simply put the office of the president. Now, over time, the executive branch has evolved because more and more cabinet offices have been added. All right, had to reboot my PowerPoint there, um, but now the pictures are working. So if you take a look at this chart, going back to the um, legislative branch, this is a list of standing committees in Congress. Um, and you can see they're very diverse in their variety. This is also a diagram that might be useful to you just to see how the legislative process works. Um, you've probably seen the I'm just a bill video from Schoolhouse Rock, but in case you don't remember the words, this is a useful diagram. All right, so back to the executive branch where we left off. Here is a, uh oh, here is an image of various cabinet positions. Um, See if you can guess which one is missing. You might notice there's one you hear a lot about that is fairly new that's missing from this image. If you guessed Homeland Security, you would be correct. The Department of Homeland Security was added during um, George W. Bush administration, so this is actually it's a more recent cabinet department than this image. A unique power that the executive branch has is the veto power, the power to reject laws. Additionally, you might hear about presidents uh, passing executive orders, which is a way in more of an emergency situation to enact laws or new policies without going through the same congressional process. Now, on to the judicial branch, which is probably the most difficult um, for people to understand in terms of its its role and its proceedings, but we're going to try to break that down and make it nice and simple. So quite simply put, the judicial branch has the responsibility to determine the constitutionality of laws and policies. This is a really great diagram if you're in class um, or if you're at home and you are not seeing this. Let's see if you can get everything in there. Um, what I would like you to do at home is to design a 10 question quiz about this diagram. So what you're seeing here is a hierarchy of the levels of courts within the judicial system. Of course, the U.S. Supreme Court is the highest, highest um, court in the country. Beneath the Supreme Court, we have the appellate courts, and then beneath that are district courts. And then 
you can look and see here that below district courts, we have district courts of appeal, we have circuit courts, we have county courts, they all have individual responsibilities. So what I'd like you to do is to create a 10 question quiz about the roles of these different levels of government, or excuse me, the different levels of the judicial system. This is really not anything that you need to know, but I think it's interesting because it illustrates the complexity of the judicial system. And this is a progression from the commission of a crime um, or alleged commission of a crime to the correction system. Now, by no means do we have a perfectly equitable criminal justice system. This is a difficult, difficult system to enforce and to modify as time goes on. Um, it's also there's a tremendous amount of expense involved in the criminal justice system, but you can see here just how many pathways, how many legal decisions need to be made um, in order to prosecute a crime. Now, for our purposes, because we're talking about the founding of the United States as a um, independent entity, we need to talk about Chief Justice John Marshall. If you have ever driven from Prince William County to Fauquier County, chances are you may have even seen a little um, sign over just, just over the Fauquier County line that indicates John Marshall's birthplace. John Marshall is not only a Virginian, but he's actually, he was born fairly close to Brentsville. You can see this drawing of him here. He's the first Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and what makes John Marshall really significant is when he first took on his role, the duty and responsibility of the judicial system, of the Supreme Court, was still very much undetermined. While the framers knew that the role of the judicial system would be to determine the constitutionality of laws, the way in which that would happen and whether or not precedent would be important was still fairly uncertain. So let's talk about what precedent means. Um, if you look at the word precedent, you're gonna see a prefix, P-R-E, and we know that that means before. Legal precedent says that in reviewing a case, often judges will consider similar cases that have come before it. And often judges will then make decisions that follow the precedent of previous cases for the sake of consistency in interpreting the law. Now the precedent that Chief Justice John Marshall sets is A, for the judicial system to function completely independently of either of the other two branches. And also we're gonna talk about a concept called judicial review that may be the most important part of his legacy. So the first really significant case I want to discuss when we think about John Marshall's court, and he presided over many, many, many cases. We're just going to talk about three that are particularly significant. The first one is Marbury versus Madison. So this is a court case in 1800, just after John Adams has lost his campaign for the presidency to Thomas Jefferson. So Adams loses in 1800. Jefferson's going to take the office of the president in 1801 um, on March 5th, 1801, I believe. Oh, yep, there it is right there. And John Adams, in what we call his lame duck period, which is really the time between when a president loses an election or is voted, uh, or a new president is voted for because that his predecessor has completed two terms, that lame duck period is when a president is just able to kind of tie up loose ends. And sometimes that means making some quick decisions to leave a legacy behind before a new president. So John Adams is a Federalist. Thomas Jefferson is an anti-Federalist, but will become Democratic Republican. And Adams wants to appoint as many local judges as he can who tend to lean more Federalist. So Adams appoints many local judges, but sometimes with such short notice that their letters of commission telling them that they have been appointed to these new jobs don't arrive in time. And when Jefferson is actually um, sworn into office in 1801, there were men such as James Marbury who had been appointed to judgeships, but they had not received their commission in time, so they couldn't take office in time. So James Marbury, like I said, is one of these people, um, and he actually sues for the right to his commission. 
So he files a lawsuit saying that John Adams had fairly appointed him, even though he didn't receive the letter, he should receive the job. He should um, step up to the position. Now, Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State, James Madison, says no. If he hadn't received the letter, he is not eligible to assume the judgeship, um, and he tells Marbury, tough luck. But they bring the case to the Supreme Court, and John Marshall rules that Marbury was actually legally appointed, of course, by John Adams. However, oh, and that the executive branch cannot tell him otherwise. But John Marshall understands the Constitution. He knows that the problem with this case to begin with is that it did not fall under the jurisdiction or the responsibility of the Supreme Court. So John Marshall says, well, according to the Constitution, it is not the role of the Supreme Court to determine whether or not Marbury should have that position. So he cannot legally grant Marbury his commission. And the court rules in favor of Madison. Now, this is very important because this illustrates some restraint on the part of John Marshall. He's given the opportunity to weigh in on a case that technically does not qualify as a federal case. And he rejects it, and he says he cannot overturn the original decision because it doesn't fall under his jurisdiction. Furthermore, he emphasizes that the role of the Supreme Court is to determine the constitutionality of a law or of a policy, and that that's not really what the Marbury versus Madison case was. And we call this judicial review, the idea that the fundamental role of the Supreme Court is to assess constitutionality. Now, the next case I want to talk about is McCulloch versus Maryland. And before we talk about McCulloch versus Maryland, we need to mention that in the early days of the newly independent United States, there was a great deal of turmoil over the idea of having a national bank. Some states wanted to have their own independent banks, in fact, even print their own currency and operate, again, independently. But a Bank of the United States, much thanks to Alexander Hamilton, was formed. The Bank of the United States opens branches in many states, but some states, like Maryland, rejected the idea that a Bank of the United States could operate within an independent state's jurisdiction. So a Bank of the United States opens in Maryland and Maryland passes a law saying that they will tax any out-of-state bank. So Maryland will not levy taxes on its own bank but it will tax an out-of-state bank. And so they charge the Bank of the United States' Maryland branch with taxes for operating there. James McCulloch is the person working for the bank responsible for paying its debts. Now, Maryland sues James McCulloch when he refuses to pay the bill that they've handed him. And of course, he this lawsuit goes to a Maryland court. Maryland rules in favor of the state's initial policy, but McCulloch appeals to the Supreme Court. Now, he's able to do this because now we're talking about interstate commerce. We're talking about a federal agency and a state agency, so they've essentially crossed boundary lines. And McCulloch appeals to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says that according to Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution, the necessary and proper clause emboldens Congress and permits Congress to perform any actions which enable it to... Um, carry out its intended duties. So in this case, the, the power of Congress is to impose taxes and to regulate interstate commerce, but the state, Maryland, that does they do not have those kinds of enumerated powers. Maryland cannot tax a federal institution. So the Supreme Court rules in favor of McCulloch and the Bank of the United States. And this is important because the case really reaffirms what are the implied powers. It defines what is considered to be a power that belongs to the federal government. It might not necessarily be explicitly stated, but it still belongs to the federal government. Now we're going to run out of time in just a few seconds on this recording. In the next video, you'll hear about a third very significant case in the Marshall Court, and then we'll wrap up our branches of government discussion.